Hey there, Navandis here with another Path of Exile build guide and this time I'm reviving an absolute classic, the Cyclone Slayer. The original version of this build was created all the way back in Legion League, but GG considered it was too powerful and slapped it with a series of nerfs. Time passed and we got a whole bunch of new stuff since then, like cluster jewels, masteries, new items, etc. and quite a few buffs to the Slayer Ascendancy. Now, Cyclone probably doesn't need any introductions, it's a Path of Exile staple, basically the equivalent of Warwind Barbs in Diablo, the spin to win boys. When you pair the innate mobility of the skill with a versatile ascendancy like the Slayer, you got an extremely powerful character that's equally good at clearing and bossing. While you might think of Cyclone as being sluggish, that's not the case for this build as we're able to sustain permanent Quicksilver Flask effect plus Onslaught on top of the Slayer's buffs, so you end up with over 40% movement speed, 51% even if you have Tailwind boots while Cycloning. Pair that with Cyclone's generous area of effect and the explosions caused by Shockwave support and you got yourself an efficient map mapping build surpassed only by high-end bow builds or custom crit builds. I farmed with it every single type of content you can think of. Deep Delve, High Tier Blight maps, Triple Nemesis plus Beyond Juiced maps, 5-way Legions, uh, Juiced Scourge maps, you name it. The build can also run any map mode, including Reflect and, while cannot leech will hurt your defenses a bit, it's by no means impossible. Speaking of defenses, while this is not a super tank like a champion or juggernaut, we're not squishy either as the build easily generates endurance charges and can maintain 21 fortification stacks even against bosses. Add to that lots of armor, stun immunity and 79% max elemental resistances. But the strongest defensive layer for this build is the Slayer's signature Infinite Leech. Thanks to this ability, as long as you're hitting enemies, you'll constantly have a healing buffer that will top off your HP as soon as it dips below 100%. Basically, if you don't get one shot, you should be able to survive and offset huge amounts of incoming damage. All these also make the build a great boss killer as you're able to constantly deal damage while still being completely mobile, dodging all the shit thrown at you and essentially healing any damage taken without relying on flasks. Not only that, but the Slayer also has 20% culling strike, meaning any hit dealt to an enemy at or below 20% HP will instantly kill them. And yes, that applies to any bosses as well, which is amazing when you consider most bosses become stronger as they get closer to dying. The Slayer is basically able to bypass the most dangerous parts of the toughest fights in the game. When it comes to the price tag, the build is basically as cheap or expensive as you want it to be and will perform exactly as you'd expect for the level of investment. If you only have 100 chaos to spend, then you'll be able to clear low red tier maps quite comfortably, but you shouldn't expect it to be smooth sailing. With 9 or 10x, you'll be able to tackle most of the average endgame content like tier 16s, conquerors, guardians, Cirrus, you know, the usual. But if you wish to make this build a long term project, then sky's the limit and you can sink a couple of mirrors in it and you'll still see improvements and gains. I actually included a separate POB in the video description with an example of what a stupidly expensive gear set looks like and what you could aim for long term. Finally, the build is an extremely good league starter and I've tested it in solo cell found Endless Delirium, arguably the hardest league star scenario we've ever had, and I had absolutely zero issues. Just make sure you prioritize upgrading your weapon with the highest DPS one you can get and you'll be cruising through the campaign. Ok, so with the sales pitch out of the way, let's see how this bad boy works. Now, Cyclone is a simple channeled ability. Keep the button pressed and you move around dealing damage like a tornado full of blades or sharks. As you're channeling, Cyclone gains stages, up to 7 at gem level 21, and its area of effect increases with each stage. While spinning, your movement speed will be lowered, but that is offset by using a Rotgut Flask, which provides both the usual movement speed buff of a Quicksilver Flask, but also Onslaught if you have Frenzy Charges to spend. And that is very easy to achieve thanks to Blood Rage and Cyclone's insane attack speed. On top of that, you can use Frost Blink while spinning without interrupting your channeling, and as tempting as that might be, there's really no reason to travel between packs using Cyclone, you can just attack with it when you actually have enemies nearby. For the weapon, we went with a two-handed staff for a few reasons. Staff passives have great crit bonuses, amazing bases such as uh, this giant pizza cutter, the eventuality rod, we get free endurance charges from smashing strikes passive, and we can use shockwave support for uh, juicy pseudo explosions and a massive DPS increase. 
While you could use two-handed axes or swords, your DPS would likely be lower, you won't have endurance charges, and you'd need to remove shockwave and adapt the passive to yourself. Now I mentioned earlier the Slayer's infinite leech and I should probably expand on that a bit, without going too deep into the whole leech mechanic, basically whenever you hit a monster with an attack and your character has any source of attack damage leech as life, you generate what's called a life leech instance. If you think of life leech as a sort of blood transfusion that your character is receiving, then a life leech instance would be a blood bag. Each of these Life Leech instances can recover a certain amount of HP, based on some more complicated math, but there is no cap to how many of them you can have running in parallel. So the more enemies you hit and the higher your attack speed, the more blood bags you get. And it just so happens that Cyclone is an area of effect attack, so capable of hitting many enemies at once. And it does about 8 to 10 attacks per second, so that's a shit ton of blood bags. However, to balance this seemingly broken mechanic, by default, all life leech effects and life leech instances are instantly removed as soon as your HP is full. In practice, this means that life leech isn't really that strong unless you're constantly hitting your target. However, the Slayer is able to bypass that restriction through its passive Brutal Fervor. That will basically act like a pocket healer without needing to be on top of your target all the time. Apart from these, the build is pretty straightforward. Pure physical damage impales crit strikes with an almost infinite scaling and DPS proportional to how much currency you invest into it. An honest build without relying on broken mechanics or uniques or the flavor of the month meta ascendancy class. Leveling up this build is also really smooth and simple. You start off as a duelist and for the first 7-8 levels or so you can use splitting steel and then transition to an amazing combo I've tested in Endless Delirium. Ground Slam and an Earth Shatter plus Earthbreaker totem setup, which is mostly used for bosses. This is a very strong 1 2 combo as the totem slams with Earth Shatter and creates those spikes, which you then break with Ground Slam and that adds up a shit ton of damage even at lower levels. At this stage, you can use any two handed mace, staff, or axe since the passive tree doesn't yet have any staff specific nodes. Just grab the weapon with the highest DPS you can find, and you can actually rely on the skill tooltip numbers for that. Once you start using shockwave support in Act 2, you'll be limited to maces and staffs, but if you find an amazing axe, then you can replace this gem with something else. Around Act 4, you can start using Cyclone, or you can even continue with the Slam setup, whichever you like more. I actually tried both on two different characters, and either worked perfectly. In any case, you can find these leveling setups in the POB under the Skills tab. Now, if this is not your first character of the league, and you can easily buy some nice leveling uniques, then I recommend getting an early Joffrey's Baptism, and later upgrade to a Yorhast Blacksteel Mace. Then go with either a Thief Storment Ring or Double Praxis to take care of all your mana issues, and the usual Gold Dream Helmet for massive resistances bonuses. Add the classic Wanderlust Boots, a Carnage Heart Amulet, a pair of the Great Old One Tentacles, and maybe a Tabula Rasa. Now, with Tabula, I'd say only use 4 or 5 links early on, as going with a full 6 link will drastically increase the mana cost. And speaking of mana, if you do have issues with that in the first few acts, grab one or two enduring mana flasks and don't reserve more than half of your mana pool with auras. Finally, here's the passive tree and the order for picking up the notable passives. You'll also find leveling trees in the POB under the tree tab dropdown. Now the build does use cluster jewels, but it works very well even without. I have included dual cluster, single cluster and no cluster variants in the POB and you can also find them under the tree tab dropdown. On the large cluster jewel, you have several very good passives for various stats. Accuracy, crit, attack speed, life leech, area of effect, etc. This allows you to fine tune your character depending on what it needs most. For example, if your chance to hit is not 100%, then something like martial prowess or graceful execution can help with that. Or if you're far from hitting 100% crit chance with all the buffs and conditional stuff up, then sure-footed striker is perfect to pump it up a bit. And if you're pretty much set with hit and crit, then you can go with the beefy generic damage passives like weight advantage, feed of fury or brutal infamy. On the medium class of jewel, there's one amazing passive pair you should be looking for, magnifier and pressure points. Quick getaway is also a decent alternative, but double damage is amazing for a skill that hits as fast as cyclone. You'll find trade links for all the cluster jewels in the POB under the notes tab. And lastly, for the bandits quest, you'll need to kill them all and get the two passive points. There are plenty of very good options on the tree that outweigh the bonuses any of the bandits would provide. 
Moving on to the Ascendancy, the Slayer is currently one of the most balanced options out there for melee damage, with a perfect mix of offense and defense, equally strong when clearing or fighting bosses. After completing the first lap, grab the Impact Passive, which perfectly exemplifies what the Slayer is all about. It provides a decent amount of accuracy, increased weapon range, which boosts the size of your Cyclone, and two conditional bonuses, increased area of effect based on the number of enemies you've killed recently, and more melee damage based on how close you are to your target. So it basically helps both clearing and single target damage and efficiency. Follow this up with Bane of Legends, which has a similar dual bonus style. More damage if you've killed recently, and more damage against unique enemies, aka bosses. Of course, if the boss has adds, you'll get both bonuses, but that's usually not the case. Oh, and Bane of Legends also makes you immune to reflected physical damage, and since you're dealing only physical damage, that basically means you're immune to any form of reflect. Third passive is the insanely strong Hezman, bringing that absurd 20% culling strike, but also extra movement and attack speed if you've killed stuff recently. And finally, after completing the last labyrinth, get brutal fervor for the massive leech bonuses, including having life leech no longer end when your HP is full. Not only that, but you also get a 10% global damage reduction while leeching, which is basically all the time you're in combat. For the Pantheon, the choices are pretty straightforward. For the Major God, go with Soul of the Brine King and upgrade the powers that provide freeze immunity and reduced effect of chill. As for the Minor God, you can go with Yugul for its reduced curse effect bonus, or Soul of Aberath for burning ground immunity and some ignite mitigation. Neither is a huge deal, but they're decent extras and come at basically no cost. And with that, let's move on to probably the most important part of the build, gems and links. Now, the numbers you'll see for each gem represent level and quality, and in some situations, we'll want to keep certain gems at a lower level than max, or quality might be useless for this build, which is why I list it as zero. Also, for the 6 link main setup, I'm listing the gems in order of their importance, so if you can only get a 5 link, just drop the last gem. So, let's start with the main skill, Cyclone, linked with Shockwave, Brutality, Melee Physical Damage, Pulverize, and Infused Channeling. This setup should be socketed in your body armor. Both Cyclone and Shockwave greatly benefit from having the gems at level 21, so try to get those upgrades as soon as possible. The same goes for the Awakened versions of Brutality and Melee Physical Damage, especially once the gems are level 5. For example, level 5 Awakened Melee Physical Damage has a chance to intimidate enemies, further increasing the damage they take beyond the regular bonuses the gem provides. Then you have a massive aura setup, Pride, Determination, Herald of Purity, Blood and Sand and Precision linked with an Enlighten of at least level 2, but ideally level 3 or 4. If you can't afford an Enlightened gem, then temporarily drop Herald of Purity. Also, keep in mind that Precision doesn't reserve a percentage of your mana pool, but rather a flat amount, which increases with the gem level. Its main purpose is to get your chance to hit to 100%, so you can actually keep this aura at a lower level than 20, depending on how much accuracy you have elsewhere. Make sure you leave about 40 mana unreserved to use skills that are not linked with life tap. Then there's a double totem setup that you'll only use against bosses or in fixed combat scenarios like Delve Nodes, Expeditions, Metamorphs, Legion Monoliths, etc. It's made out of Ancestral Protector, Val Ancestral Warchief, Maim and Life Tap. Since your totem limit is 1, the only way to have both the Warchief and the Protector totems out at the same time is to use Val Ancestral Warchief but only the Val part of the skill as that bypasses the totem limit. The main reason why you want to use these totems is for the absolutely massive melee damage and attack speed buffs they provide while you're in their range. Sure, it might be a pain in the ass to manage them, but I cannot overstate just how much extra DPS you get by plopping down these totems. Besides, for most boss fights, you'll only need to use them once in the beginning and the fight will be over before they're dropped or expire. As for the supports, MAME causes targets hit by your totems to take extra physical damage from any source, so from your Cyclone, and Life Tap allows you to spend life instead of mana to summon the totems. Then you have an utility plus mobility setup made out of Frost Blink, Blood Rage and Life Tap. Blood Rage gives you a really strong buff that refreshes every time you kill an enemy and provides a massive attack speed and a 25% chance to gain a frenzy charge on kill. In turn, Frenzy Charges further boost your damage and attack speed, and they're also the fuel for your Rodgat Flask. 
but Blood Rage does come with a downside in a form of a really strong life degen debuff, you can however offset it pretty easily through life leech. Nevertheless, don't use this against bosses as the most important part, the frenzy charges, only works on kill and not on hit. The attack speed bonus is not enough to justify the life degen during boss fights. Finally, add a Dread Banner here, but do not link it with the rest of the gems as, for some strange reason, Life Tap will apply its mana multiplier penalty to the banner. Unfortunately, we have no other place where the banner can be socketed, so you'll just have to have an unlinked socket for it here. And the last gem setup is a simple custom damage taken setup with a trigger gem at level 4 linked with Molten Shell level 12. After taking a certain amount of damage, this setup will trigger the Molten Shell skill which creates a damage absorption shield based on how much armor you have. For the last two sockets, we have Assassin's Mark triggered by that fancy new support gem Mark on Hit that GEG mentioned in the development manifesto for 3.17. It hasn't yet been added to POB, but as soon as it is, I'll update it as well. Ok, so now let's talk a bit about gearing. First, you'll find trade links in the notes tab of the POB and generally I list 3 tiers. Basic, mid tier and best in slot with price and performance increasing with each tier. There are overall a few major goals you'll have for gearing up this character. First, the obvious, get your elemental resistances capped. The second priority is to get your chance to hit to 100% through various sources of accuracy, either from Cluster Jewel passives, gear or the Precision Aura. Lastly, you need enough decks and int to level up your blue and green gems and you can find these attributes on gear pieces like rings, amulet, gloves, boots and even body armor sometimes or regular jewels. Apart from that, it's mostly about DPS and the best damage modes you're looking for are flat physical damage, increased critical strike chance, critical strike multiplier and attack speed. Defense wise, evidently you'll need as much life as possible on basically every piece of gear except the weapon and the bases should ideally be pure armor ones. So starting from the top, a basic tier helmet should be a rare one with some life, elemental resistances and maybe some accuracy or chaos resistance. Upgrade that to either a crown of the inward die, the more balanced DPS plus defense option or an abyssus going more glass cannon. Now no matter what, if you go with the abyssus, look for one that has at most 41 or 42% increased physical damage taken, any higher than that and you're just asking for trouble. For the enchant, by far the best one is Ancestral Protector Totem grants 18% increased attack speed while active. This of course means it's really only useful against bosses cause that's where you should be using the totem but that's also where you'd need some extra DPS anyway. The weapon is a two handed stuff with as much physical DPS as possible. Keep in mind that elemental damage is absolutely useless for this build since you're using brutality support. A good starting point is a 450 plus physical DPS one, ideally with some extra crit chance or crit multiplier and something like that could easily get you to low red tier maps. The unique hegemony Zira is a fantastic option that is usually quite cheap even early in a league. For best in slot, well, sky's the limit and you can find staffs pushing 1100-1200 physical DPS with both crit chance and crit multi. Sure, something like that will cost you a kidney or two, but the point is, there's a very wide range of upgrades for this gear slot. The absolute best base you should aim for is an eventuality rod, which increases your maximum number of power and endurance charges. Next, the body armor. Initially, you can go with a rare having 5 links, 80 plus flat maximum life, resistances, and perhaps percentage increased maximum life or an empty prefix to craft that yourself. From that, upgrade to a 6 link with a mod socketed attacks have minus 15 to total mana cost, which is a gigantic quality of life bonus as Cyclone ends up being free. For best in slot, push that even further by adding at least one of the two following mods listed in order of their power. Chance to gain a frenzy charge on hit, you can apply an additional curse or attacks have plus percentage to critical strike chance. A few weeks into the league, a 6 link armor with these mods on top of the minus mana one doesn't usually cost more than 7 to 8x. Moving on to gloves, here you want to stack up as much damage as possible in the form of flat physical damage, flat accuracy attack speed or global critical strike chance. Add some flat maximum life and fill in any empty suffixes with resistances or decks whichever you still need more of. For best and slot you can try to get those on a spiked gloves base for the additional melee damage implicit. Next up, boots, maximum life, 25 to 30 movement speed and as much resistance as you can squeeze in, both elemental and chaos. 
we can actually quite easily get over 100 resistance here, especially on a pair of two-toned boots. For best in slot, you can sacrifice some resistance and get a pair with the mod you have Tailwind if you have dealt a critical strike recently. Tailwind is a buff that increases your action speed, in this case meaning attack and movement speed, both very very useful for this build. Moving on to your belt, quite similar to boots, this is a slot where initially you should stack up as much life and resistances as possible, including chaos resistance. On basic tier, you can go with the rustic sash for the increased physical damage implicit, while for mid tier, you should swap the base for a stygian vice and get that extra abyssal jewel socket. However, for best in slot, the unique Rizlata's coil is pretty much unbeatable for physical damage builds. A perfectly rolled belt would have 30% less minimum physical damage and 40% more max physical damage. While such a belt would be very expensive, you can use divine orbs to get as close to that as possible. Finally, make sure you apply abrasive catalysts on this belt to further increase its damage bonuses. Up next we have the amulet, a pretty versatile gear piece which is also the best place for stacking large amounts of int and dex. Apart from that you basically try to get as many damage mods as you can while still keeping your elemental resistances cap and ideally positive chaos resistance. Flat physical damage, accuracy, increased critical strike chance and crit multiplier are the most common DPS affixes you should be aiming for. Warlord influenced amulets can also roll increased mana reservation efficiency mods for pride or determination. With one such mod you'll have enough mana to push the precision gem at level 20 which in turn means you won't need as much accuracy on other pieces of gear. Now amulets can be anointed by talking to the NPC Cassia and using oils dropped from blight encounters. This way you can have any notable passive from the tree added to your amulet. For this build the optimal choice is Panopticon which further increases the buffs provided by your ancestral totems. So this anoint is obviously useful only when you're dropping down your totems and won't impact your general clearing DPS. However, you don't really need additional damage outside boss fights, so that's what you should double down on. Now, if you're one of those weird people that doesn't like killing bosses faster, then something like Titanic Impact is a decent alternative that applies unconditionally. Finally, if you feel like you're a bit too squishy, then discipline and training is the way to go. Rings are pretty much like the amulet, except you wear them on your fingers or other appendages. So you know the drill, life, resistances, flat physical damage, accuracy crit mods, rings are also a great place for getting any leftover int or dex you might need and it shouldn't be too hard or expensive to do that. Apart from that, on one of the rings you really want curse enemies with vulnerability on hit, once you have a body armor with you can apply an additional curse. For best in slot, you can pair the Curse Ring with a well-rolled Circle of Guilt Unique. You should look for one with the two mods, Increased Physical Damage while affected by Herald of Purity and Herald of Purity has increased mana reservation efficiency. This ring can also roll up to three implicits from a really large mod pool, so try to get three stats that are useful for this build, such as damage, accuracy, resistances, interdex, uh, life, etc. Next, jewels. I covered the cluster jewels in the passive tree section, so go watch that if you skipped it. Apart from that, you should ideally also get a Watcher's Eye with a Pride Aura mode, the best one being Impales you apply, last two additional hits, and the chance to deal double damage as a close second. If you can afford it, then pairing one of those two modes with a Precision Aura damage mode would be a great DPS boost. On rare jewels you want life, flat physical damage, increased critical strike chance, critical strike multiplier, accuracy, attack speed and generic melee or physical damage. You should know this by now. These modes come in a variety of formats so make sure you use the trade links in the POB. And last but not least, the flasks. You'll obviously need a life flask, ideally a seething or terrified divine life flask of staunching. Basically you want some instant healing and bleed removal slash immunity. Then you want a Lion's Roar for a decent damage bonus paired with a good chunk of armor and Rodgut, which I mentioned earlier in the guide, basically a 2-in-1 Quicksilver plus Silver Flask as long as you can generate the Frenzy Charges to fuel it. In boss fights you can replace it with a regular Silver Flask as you won't be able to reliably get Frenzy Charges. For the remaining two flasks you have a couple of options. If you haven't yet gotten a minus mana cost body armor then you'll absolutely want an enduring mana flask. Otherwise replace it with a basalt flask with reduced effect of curses or increased armor suffix. Last one can be a diamond flask with a shock removal suffix and later on replaced by the insanely strong and expensive bottled faith. 
The prefix on the silver, diamond and basalt flasks should be one that provides charges when you deal a critical strike such as surgeons or doctors. Learn anything new, Exile?